Now, it's amazing how in the church, um, different teachings get lost over time and their meanings change. And, um, and the beautiful faith that's been passed down for 2,000 years sometimes gets turned up on its head. And this is perhaps most apparent in how uh, we've begun to think about baptism. Now, this is a problem uh, across Christianity, in, uh, especially, especially in the Western world. Now, in, uh, most, most Christians I've met in America, for example, think that baptism is how they show that they've chosen to be saved by Jesus. For Americans, baptism is about a spiritual experience, a conversion experience. And unsurprisingly, like everything in our, uh, in our age, it's become all about me. But baptism isn't just, of course, misunderstood in our country. A huge number of cultural Christians uh, people who would identify as Christian but never really go to church or believe much of it, uh, in countries like England, for example, think that baptism is just what you do to your babies. There, there in England, so, often it's more about superstition and tradition than anything else. Many pastors in England, I know, have to baptize infants. It's required, actually, by uh, the Church of England rules. Um, and they have to baptize children whose parents will never again show up in church. Sometimes they actually just want their kids to be able to get into the right school, and so they get them baptized. But nevertheless, they'll insist that their child should be baptized. So what in the world is this ancient practice that we see John uh, the baptizer doing? Now let's ignore uh, a lot of the silly debates that have sprung up about whether you have to go into a river and be fully immersed or just be sprinkled or whatever. All of those things are kind of silly. But let's look at the source of baptism in the Bible. Let's look at John, this guy who is baptizing. We're going to talk about three main points uh, about his baptism. The first thing is that, as we see, baptism is a way to prepare the way for the coming king. That's what John kept saying. And the second thing we're going to say is baptism is about God, and it's not about me. And the third thing is that baptism is an act of renouncing our citizenship of our homeland and taking an oath of allegiance to King Jesus, and so living according to his rules and joining in his mission of reconciliation. So let's look at the first thing. Baptism is a way for us to prepare the way for the returning king. Well, the first thing to say is the king isn't here. We like to think that the world is run by God, and we, uh, how many times after the election did I see signs on churches or on Facebook or whatever say, it doesn't matter who wins, God's still in control. But the message of the New Testament is clear. God is not the boss of the world right now. We do not yet see everything submitted under the feet of Jesus, the book of Hebrews says, and that's exactly why we have this season of, an, season of Advent. That's why we see injustice. That's why we see evil. If God were running the world, we wouldn't have evil. It's that simple. So the answer is God's not the one running the world right now. The Bible is actually very clear about that. He left that task to his followers. This is what he commissioned his disciples to do at, at when he left, to go into all the world and make followers, to build his kingdom by uh, bringing new people in. So John is doing the same thing. Although he's preparing for the first coming of Jesus, we do similar things by preparing for his second coming. Now, what does that mean to prepare the way? Uh, it means many things, and the first of which John talks about repentance. When you saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, these great religious teachers who thought they had all the answers, come to him, he, he kind of yells at them and says, well, you're a bunch of vipers, you're liars you're actually really quite evil and full of venom. Why? Because you, you think you have all the answers, but you don't. He says, the king is coming, and he's going to judge. Right? That's all that language between uh, about uh, the axe is at the root of the tree. Basically, you're a tree, and if you're not bearing fruit, God's going to chop you down. That's what John's saying. Uh, and he says, you know, God's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, in the ancient world, when you harvested wheat, uh, you had to separate the, the actual kernel you wanted from the husk and the, the straw. And the straw is the chaff. 
and you know what they would do is they had a winnowing fork like a pitchfork and they'd throw it up in the air and then the wind would blow away the husks and the straw but the heavier grains would fall to the ground and that's kind of how they separated it out before the days of uh, mechanization that's what John is talking about what Jesus is coming to do what the king is coming to do is what any king would do he's coming to do justice to separate the righteous from the wicked and Jesus himself kind of, uh, you know, confuses John when he shows up because he says, you know what, that's going to happen, but I'm not doing that here and now. He said, I didn't come to judge now. I came to give people an opportunity. One day I will come to judge, but not yet. And so that's why, again, we have Advent, where we look forward to God's coming judgment. Right now we don't see the weeds and the, t- and the wheat separated. All of us live together. And our mission is not to decide in the world who is which kind of thing, but to call people to repentance, just like John did. So if you think about it, a king is returning, and John says, we must repent. We've done wrong things. We haven't served our king. We need to turn around. That's what repentance means. Turn around. Go the opposite direction we're going in. Repentance is is bigger than forgiveness. Uh, Forgiveness, we often think, is what Christianity is all about, but it's only a part of it, right? Jesus, when he catches the woman, you know, uh, the woman who's caught in adultery, um, and she's about to be stoned, he doesn't just say, ah, don't worry about it, you're okay. He says, look, no one's here to condemn you. Now go and stop sinning. You got to change your life. Don't end up in this situation again. It's not, hey, this is free, just do whatever you want now. Uh, He's not affirming her lifestyle. He's saying, this is your opportunity. Today is the day for you to make a difference in your life. And that's exactly what John the baptizer was asking people to do. Now, those people who, who say that they're sorry, but then move on to do the same thing and pray the same prayer of repentance all the time, but keep living in the same way, that's what John and Jesus would call hypocrisy. Repentance requires turning around. Now, once we're prepared for Jesus' return as the king, then we must begin preparing the world for his return. That means seeking justice. That means seeking reconciliation and peace between people, fighting oppression, finding the ways that the poor and the weak, uh, as we read in Isaiah, God is going to judge on their behalf for them. That means it's our job now to to bring peace and reconciliation to them. Above all, it means submitting all people to our king. Baptism is a commission. Not only is it a sign of our uh, seeking repentance, it's a commission. It's joining God's kingdom. It's how you join God's army of peacemakers. That's what baptism is about. So that first thing, right, the first point was Baptism is about preparing the way for the return of the king. That's what John kept talking about. The second thing is that baptism is about God and not about me. Baptism is actually about how God has been faithful to his promises, not about my choices. It's not about what I can do for God, but what about what God has done for us. We like to think that it's this personal statement. You know, uh, in our day, people ask you, oh, what's... You know, you can fill it out on a form, you know, like age, gender, race, religion. All of those things are just options that you have to tick on a box when you're dealing with the government or something. But it's not about your choice, and it's not about your experience of life. It's about your response to what God has been doing already in your life. It's about the whole church joining together and recognizing and remembering what God has done for us in Jesus, just like we do at communion. Now, remember John the baptizer? When Jesus showed up a little bit later in this passage, he made it clear, hey, baptism isn't about me, and he said, it's not about you. He says, here I am baptizing you with water, but actually one day, somebody's going to come who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus shows up, he says, I'm not even worthy to, t- to carry his sandals. John says, I must decrease, 
and he must increase. And that's exactly what baptism is about, about saying, it's not about me. I must decrease. He must increase. We're joining God's kingdom. And so we're saying that great statement because baptism is a symbol of how we die with Jesus in order to be raised with him. See, our life as following Jesus is called discipleship, right? And to be a disciple is to be a follower. But part of that word is also discipline, right? To be, part, to be a disciple means you have to live a disciplined life. Uh, you can't just do whatever you want and, and follow somebody. You have to live your life in the right way. Um, and that's what discipleship is about. It's about carrying our cross. Jesus doesn't call us to get saved or even necessarily to live a life of good morality. See, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were morally upstanding people. They were the pillars of their community. But the reason Jesus and John get mad at them is that they're hypocrites. They think they're great, but they're oppressing the poor. The good morality and getting saved, these are what you might call byproducts or side effects of the real work that God is doing. Jesus calls us to join his kingdom. But actually, the cost of entrance into his kingdom is very high. We have to die to ourselves and to our old lives and to use our new lives to bring glory to God. We can't have this uh, this being born again thing that John talks to Nicodemus or Jesus talks to Nicodemus about without dying first. Resurrection, our whole gospel, resurrection, isn't just about how we get to be better people. It's about dying, right? Death is an integral part of that. Now, it doesn't necessarily, of course, mean we have to literally die, although that's part of it. But what John is asking people to do when they come to the Jordan River is to give up their old way of life, right? Repentance means turn around, do something different. Now, when we die to ourselves in our old lives, we have to use our new lives to bring glory to God. And that means more than just going to church. It means preparing the way in the, in the world, here and now, preparing Canyon City for Jesus' return. So we have baptism about being about preparing the way for the returning king. We have baptism being about what God is doing, not what our feelings are. And the third thing is that baptism is about joining God's people and his kingdom. So baptism is not really about us necessarily just joining this or that church. Baptism is a bold statement that the world that you are uh, giving up it's, it's a statement to the world that you're giving up all your commitments to sin and evil. We're giving up our allegiance to the devil and his works and his followers. We're giving up our love of all the worldly things and bringing them to the foot of the cross because the cross is the entry gate into God's kingdom. Jesus says the road is narrow and the gate is small that leads to life and few find it. It doesn't allow us to bring our baggage in. We have to lay all our stuff down at the gate, at the cross. We have to lay down our previous lives, our loves, our commitment to pleasing ourselves, to making life about how I get to be happy, our commitment to having a good time, to thinking that life is all about me and what I can get out of it. When we lay down these loves and pick up the cross, we find that they were all burdens. When we pick up the cross, we find out that all our previous loves were burdens to us. And that what Jesus says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light, becomes true. It's a heavy thing to pick up our cross, but once you pick it up, you'll find that it is a lot lighter than everything else you're carrying around with you. When we're baptized, we commit ourselves to following Jesus, and that means living for him and not for ourselves. It means understanding that God doesn't exist to make us happy, to affirm us as we are, to say, hey, good job, to celebrate me. God didn't die to give me a good life. He died so I could join his kingdom to be his follower, to bring justice to a broken world. Jesus demands total loyalty, and this is why we have to carry a cross 
for the rest of our lives. Jesus tells us we must pick up our cross daily and follow him. And this becomes our joy, our mark of citizenship in the kingdom of God. Christians, hear this. The mark of your being part of God's kingdom is your abandonment of your own kingdoms. From this point on, everything you do is for the king. Do you eat? You do it for the king. Do you work? You do it as a way to make relationships with people in the world who need to know about Jesus. Do you learn and study? You do it to learn more about your king and what he desires of you. The life of a disciple, the one who has been baptized, is the life of submitting every aspect of our life to our king and seeing that everything that happens to you in your life is part of God's mission, part of the mission of expanding your kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus. Now, to conclude, I want to just uh, talk about one further misunderstanding we often have, um, and that is how many times can you get baptized? We've said baptism isn't about me, right? It's about what God has done. Maybe many of you have been uh, baptized, maybe as an infant or at a younger time in your life. A lot of people have told me, uh, and a lot of churches do this, they baptize people again and again to show that their walk of faith means something to them, means something more now than it did at some other time. But you see, until about the year in the mid-1500s, no Christian was ever permitted to be baptized more than once. And to this day, the vast majority of churches do not permit a second baptism. And why not? Why, why would that be a problem? Well, the first thing is Paul tells us in the Bible, there's just one baptism. There's one kingdom of God, and when you commit to join it, that, that's what happens. You can't join a kingdom more than once. You could stay and be a bad citizen, but repentance is what's needed, not joining a kingdom again and again and again. It also makes baptism about me again and my faith and my spiritual experience. Say, hey, look at everybody. I grew a bit in my faith. Well, that's great, but you're still part of his kingdom. We expect that of everybody. Baptism is the beginning of a whole life journey, and it's about God, not about me. And rebaptism actually divides the church. Paul himself talks about this in the book of 1 Corinthians. If you get baptized into this or that church uh, under this or that leader, that's wrong. Paul even goes so far to tell the Corinthians, he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. Why would he say that? Because the Corinthians were using baptism as a sign of division, the complete opposite purpose of what it's about. They're saying, hey, I was baptized under Paul, or I was baptized under Peter, so I'm better than you kind of a thing. I'm baptized into this church. Well, I'm better than you because I was baptized into that church. Unfortunately, the sin of the Corinthians carries on to our own time. But we, as a Presbyterian church, join our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Lutheran, Methodist, Episcopal, and other Reformed churches, and many others in welcoming the baptism of any church that believes in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you have been baptized, you have been baptized into his kingdom, not into ours, not into this church, but into his great kingdom. And rebaptism means that we, we think we can leave God's people and, and his kingdom and come back when we feel like it. This is how we think of democracy, but this is a kingdom, and kings don't allow that. No government allows you to just get citizenship at your whim and cast it off. Most countries call that treason. And Believe me, I know how hard it is for someone to even start thinking about becoming a citizen of another country, right? This isn't something you just take lightly. So there's one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, but we remember our baptism often, just as we celebrate communion. So this morning we have a great privilege uh, in which uh, Randy Ford, who is over here, has come uh, wanting to be baptized, and we would like to join with him in affirming his baptism recommitting his life to Jesus. God is faithful. God has not cast us or him out of his kingdom, and he will not do so. We don't leave God's kingdom because God is faithful to his promises, and he has promised not to separate us out until he comes again.
And how are you following Jesus? Do you think of your baptism? Do you think of it as laying your own life down and the loves of the world and taking up the cross on the narrow way of God's kingdom? Do you see yourself as a citizen of God's land or do you love the world and the things of the world? Is the world there to please you, to make you happy? Or is the world crying out for justice, crying out for you to prepare the way for the returning king? Now, Randy told me that he came to understand that it was time to grow up, to start life afresh, to take responsibility. Amen. That's exactly what baptism is about. And how about you? If you hear the voice of God today, do not harden your hearts, but let them be stirred up to joining in the mission that God has laid before you.